Claudio DeMarco interviewing John Pratt on January 12th, 2004 at his house. All right, uh, what is your full name? John B. Pratt. Right. Where were you born? I was born in Utica, New York. It's doing fine now. Are you a percussionist? At one point. Huh? At one point. That was for a little while. All right. I think so. Going again. A percussionist. All right. What is your full name? John B. Pratt. All right. And where were you born? I was born in Utica, New York. All right. Uh, what kind of education did you have prior to going into the military? Well, I, I finished high school and two years of college at Wesleyan University in Middletown, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. Uh, what were then you I went into the service. What were you studying in college? Uh, at that point, uh, not very much. <laughs> uh, I actually ended up majoring in economics, but at that time I was just going to college. All right. And uh, when did you hear about Pearl Harbor? A group of us went to the movies every Sunday afternoon after Sunday dinner at the fraternity house. We walked down the hill to the movies. And we were in the theater on that Sunday afternoon when the lights came on and the manager came out and announced that our, air, our naval base at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii had been bombed by the Japanese. Uh, uh, what were your, your thoughts and feelings when he told you that? Well, we left the theater and went back up to the fraternity house, and the next day, five of us drove down to uh, Floyd Bennett Field in Long Island and enlisted in the Navy. Oh, all right. In the Naval V-5 flight training program. All right. So, um, what was your uh, family's thoughts on you going to the military? I was single. What was my family status? Your, your, your parents, brothers? Oh yeah, I was living at home with my parents. Well, I was in college, but yeah, I was living at home with my parents well, and white wings. What were their thoughts on you joining the military? Well, I don't know. My mother was, of course, very upset. Mothers always are. Uh, my father just sort of took it. But I didn't go on active duty right away. They told me to go back because I needed to finish my second year of college before I would be eligible to go into the V-5 flight training, pilot training program. It wasn't until later that they changed that. All right. So what, all I did was sign the paper and then went back to school. All right. uh, when did you go back from school to the military? Oh, in June, mm -hmm. I got called. Uh, went into the military in June. Into the V-5 flight training program? Well, into, into Naval Pre-Flight School in Iowa City, Iowa. All right. And uh, what did you do there? Push-ups by the thousands. Physical <laughs> training it was. And we had some, some uh, college-level book courses, navigation, meteorology, and, and uh, I can't recall everything, naval history, but a lot of physical training. I can remember playing football in full football gear in the summertime in Iowa, and it was hot. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, and uh, where did you go from your original training in Iowa City? Oh, let's see, boy. Beginning to get a little bit vague. We're talking 1942 now. Let's see. After Iowa City, I came home on a furlough. And my next assignment was to primary flight training at Wool Chamberlain Field in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. So that was where I went. So uh, you went and up. And there was where I learned to fly the. The uh, Stearman, it was the open cockpit biplane, the Navy called it N2S4. It was a nice little airplane, wonderful plane to fly. They also had another open cockpit plane which was made by the Naval Aircraft Factory. It looked very similar but it was a little different and that was called an N3N. 
but I flew in and soloed in on September 27th, 1942, an N2S4, Stearman open cockpit biplane. What was uh, your your daily routine like when you were working or training there? Well, you were up or real early in the morning, as I recall, well before the sun came up, and uh, physical exercise, you did a lot of PT, and then you did your daily flight training, three hours, I think, of that, and then you had three or four hours of, of book learning that you had to go to, and more PT, and then a parade, you always have to have a parade, <laughs> and uh, and then I guess supper, and then uh, you went to bed. Uh, so uh, you did, and you qualified solo flying. Yeah. And uh, where where did they send you from there? Did you continue training? Uh, let's see what happened. Somewhere along the line, everything came apart. I'm trying to figure where it was. It was out there, I guess, in Minneapolis. And I didn't know it, but my eyesight, my depth perception went. And that was rather important in the Navy because you were taught to make what they call a full stall landing and you had to hit on the first 20% of the carrier deck. If this is the deck, mm -hmm. the wind is blowing this way, carrier's going that way, you're coming in and you got to land right on the very back. You won't go way up in there and land. You've got to land way back here. And you brought it down, and you stalled it, let it level off, and stalled it, and then when it lost flying speed, you just pulled the stick back in your gut and dropped it. Ten feet. It was, oh, they were always a little bumpy, but they were always good landings. You know? mm -hmm. And you did it that way so that that hook would catch the wire. Mm -hmm. On an aircraft carrier, you know, you got a wire for the for the hook on the plane to catch, to keep it from going into the ones that are parked in the front. Yeah. And uh, this particular time, I thought I was 10 feet off the ground and I was somewhere around 30 feet off instead. And when I came down, I came down a little bit too hard for the airplane. Uh, all right. And uh, it spoiled their airplane and it gave them a different attitude towards me. And they thought it would be better for the war effort if I tried another line of work. So, so uh, why did they send you from Minneapolis then? Home. Home. Yeah, that was it. I was done with the Navy. All right, uh, then... It was amazing. You know, anybody, anybody that wanted to get out couldn't get out to save his butt. And I got out and didn't want it. And I was out. <laughs> Boom. Civilian. So, uh, so I came home. And I went down to talk to an Army recruiting guy. I didn't know what the hell to do. Well, I went to a recruiting Army recruiter in uh, Minneapolis. They let me stay on the base, but other than that, I had no place to go, nothing to do. So uh, this guy in the Army said, go home. And wait till you get drafted, and then when you get drafted, apply for the Air Corps. So, see, to go way back to square one, when I was little, I had polio. Now, I could do it all right, but I knew that I would be no good as a, uh, one of these uh, 10th Mountain Division guys, or even an infantry guy. It was just, I couldn't do it. But I, I was all right as long as I could be in an airplane and stand and not have to hike. So that was why I wanted to stay with the airplanes. So one day in our barracks, in I was in Miami then, taking basic training, and now I'm in the Army Air Corps down in Miami, Florida, taking basic training all over again. Same thing. And uh, only this time, I was doing it because I was one of the squad leaders because I had done it all before. Mm -hmm. So anyway, 
in comes this corporal one day and he says, boy, have I got a deal for you. He says, you're going to go to navigator school and become a navigator and you'll get to be a second lieutenant. But better than that, we're going to send you to college so you can learn to be a gentleman. <laughs> I said, I've been to college and I am a gentleman. and I do not want to spend the whole war going to school. And he was aghast, but I said, I choose not to go because I just don't want to keep going to college and going to school. So he left, and the next day they shipped me out to Las Vegas to gunnery school. Aerial gunner. Mm -hmm. Now that was a six weeks course. In six weeks I became an aerial gunner. And then right after that, they sent me to Sioux Falls, South Dakota, to radio school. 18 weeks there, learning to be a radio operator. And then assigned to a bomber crew. We flew for three months down in Pio, Texas, West Texas. On Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Texas blows into Oklahoma. And on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, Oklahoma comes back to Texas down in that part of the world. <laughs> and uh, that was where I spent three months, in between the dust storms, flying as a training as a radio operator on the B-17s. And they put together our crews, and then we were shipped from there to Grand Island, Nebraska, where they gave us a brand new airplane and we got in our brand new airplane and flew it to Portland, Maine. And then we flew it to Reykjavik, Iceland the next day. And the weather was bad. We had to stay there a couple of days. And then we flew from Reykjavik, Iceland to Stornoway, Scotland on the Isle of Lewis off of northern Scotland. And we landed there, and then we went from there to, I can't recall the name of it, a place actually on the, on the British island. Um, and then they took our airplane away, and we went by train to what was eventually our, become our base at Grafton Underwood in England. And I don't know whatever became of the plane we had. They did something else with that. But they all had to be modified. They had to have certain radio equipment added and some stuff removed. For example, they took the de-icer boots, rubber de-icer boots. They took them off and replaced them with metal because the flak could hit that rubber and tear great chunks of it right off and spoil the airfoil and cause the plane to go out of control. So they took all those rubber, you know you know what they are? Uh, uh, it was a rubber, inflatable rubber leading edge to the wing. Uh -huh. And the pilot would activate this thing and it would make the rubber go like this if the plane iced up, okay. you see? And the pumping of that rubber would break the ice up because building up ice on the airfoil destroys the shape of the airfoil and makes the plane unflyable. So the idea of these rubber boots was to break that ice up if, if you got into weather conditions that caused it, to break it up and get it off the wing so it wouldn't spoil the airfoil. But we didn't have that kind of a situation where we were flying at 25,000 feet and up you didn't have that kind of a problem. It was just cold, but it was dry. So they took the rubber out and replaced it with, with sheet metal so that the whole section of the front of the wing wouldn't become torn out if it got hit by flag. Makes sense. Well, they had to learn these things the hard way. They lost airplanes and they found out why. But that rubber was being torn out and then the whole wing would come apart. Yeah. Um, 
So you're stationed in the British Isle. Right, uh, Grafton what, Underwood, right. about 90 miles north of London. What, uh, what was your daily routine? Well, if we had a mission to be anywhere from 1.30 to 3.30 in the morning, they'd come and get you. I'll tell you, breakfast, in half an hour, briefing in an hour. We had to drag out, get dressed, go down to the mess hall and get some breakfast. But they always gave us a good breakfast. And then go to briefing, which was a big room where all of their crews were assembled. MPs were guarding the gates and they wouldn't let anybody in that wasn't part of the air crew that was actually flying that day. And uh, everybody sat down and they got a big board, blackboard up and drew, showed the maps and drew pictures and showed aerial photos of the targets and explained why we were going to this particular target. Made synthetic rubber or did this, did that, whatever. I remember the day we went to Posen, Poland, which was the longest mission I ever had. I think it was 11 hours and 50 minutes of solid flying time. And from England to Posen, Poland and back, and they made, there were two targets. And the, the uh, the bomber stream, one group would go this way and the other group would go, as we approached the target, would boom, 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 every other one. One would go to one target, which was wings and fuselage assembly factories, and uh, the other target was where they made the tail assemblies and the landing gears. And so one group would go to this factory and the next one would go to this factory and the alternate groups would go on the different sides of town, and as we, we turned around and then came back. But I remember going to all the wings, and I think we went to the wings and tails factory. Not that it made a whole lot of difference. <laughs> uh, what was your daily routine on days that you didn't have a mission? We got to sleep a little bit, and then we get up. <laughs> Jeez. And if, not every time, but occasionally you'd, you'd have to do laundry. The officers had a laundry facility. The enlisted men were expected to take care of it themselves. So we'd build fires, little fireplaces, little rings of stones all around the building about two guys to a fire spot, get a bucket of water, shave up a cake of GI, that yellow soap, you know, that scrub mm -hmm. soap, shave it up with a knife in that bucket, and heat it, and then put your clothes in it and wash them. And then the real dumb thing was, in between, you brought buckets of gasoline you drew off the airplanes and brought up by hanging them over the handlebars of your bike to put your uh, wool blouse to pants and, and stuff in to clean them. You know, you didn't throw them in the whole water. And here we are with fires all over the place and buckets of gasoline in between. <laughs> I wonder somebody didn't get confused and pour a bucket of gasoline in a fire. Wow. But I recall that it was really a wild scene. <laughs> that would be one of the things we did. And every once in a while, you got a three-day pass and would go to London. But uh, and you, you know, you were at free in the evening if you wanted to. But usually, we were so tired, we didn't bother going anyplace. Went to bed. Okay. Uh, what was your crew like? Who was in your crew? Yeah, uh, plan. Oh, they were great guys. They were, they had a pilot, co-pilot, bombardier, navigator. They were the four officers. Then there was a top turret gunner. He was the engineer. 
Then there was me, I was the radio man. Then there were two waste gunners and a ball turret gunner down in the ball below and a tail gunner in the rear. And uh, at, at ten guys, but later we went back to nine and I used to come out of the radio room and take over one of the waste guns. Hmm. But, you know, it was a, we were a good group of guys. And so uh, you had, you, your officers were good too? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, we all got along real well. All right. um, you have uh, <laughs> quite an impressive list of decorations, medals, and commendations here. Uh, what did you get the Distinguished Flying Cross for? See, somebody asked me that the other day, that colonel. And I was going to tell him I didn't get it for being on time for meals, but essentially I did. Because <laughs> if we got back, we made it to a meal, and, <laughs> and I got it for coming back. On a complete tour. <laughs> wow. And uh, what they gave it to us for was still being alive after flying. What they thought was a sufficient number of of uh, missions to call it quits and go home. How many missions did you fly? I flew 32. Wow. What um? What did you get your air medals for? Uh, well, they gave you an air medal for every what four or five five missions. Mm -hmm. He flew five and got an air medal. It was basically the the uh, the uh, citation said for extraordinary achievement. If being alive is an achievement, I guess it is. Yeah, I was I was flying in my fifth assigned B-17 when I flew my last mission. The previous four had all been shot down with other crews. So you know there was a, the odds were pretty much against you making it. Wow. And uh, you were given New York State's conspicuous service cross. Yeah. All the same stuff. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Can they... Yeah, Sen Jim Donovan gave me that. Senator Donovan. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us about some of your other missions that you did? Well, they pretty much were very much, pretty much alike. You got up early in the morning and you went down to Chow we were lucky because I knew some guys later that were at other outfits that got a real bad deal when it came to breakfast before they took off. And some of these guys got shot down and they didn't get another breakfast for two or three years. <laughs> and uh, we always got a good meal. So I was glad of that. We had a good breakfast. Oh, yeah. speaking of meals, flyers had to have special food. We couldn't eat what the regular ground personnel ate mm -hmm. because of gas. When you go to high altitude, any gas that's in your body expands. And if you ate something like baked beans, and the army made baked beans that were really good, but you couldn't eat them because it would kill you. Terrible. Oh, uh, you get to high altitude, and, I, and the gas from those beans expands at an enormous rate. And boy, I'm telling you, it was. I got caught once. We were going someplace. And we weren't supposed to go to the next day. Yeah. Oh, I know. That was the night we went to Reykjavik, Iceland. 
and we we were supposed to stay there and then they came and they told us after we had already gone to bed to get up and get out because there was another group coming in and they didn't have any room for them and we had to leave that night and we had had beans and that was all right because we were only going to go to 12,000 feet but we got out there and we got into an awful mess of weather and we got screwed up and we had to go to altitude to get above the weather so that the navigator could find the stars to navigate and we didn't break out of it till we got to 26,000 feet. And I'm sitting back there in the radio room and I wonder why am I so damn cold and having such a hard time breathing. Nobody bothered to contact us from the cockpit. They just climbed. <laughs> and the rest of us, the two waist gunners, were asleep in the waist. You know, this is the middle of the night. We're flying across the ocean you know, to uh, Scotland. And nobody came back and said, we're climbing, you better get your oxygen mask out. <laughs> and finally, the co-pilot came back to see what was happening we were all stupefied. <laughs> well, he got us cranked up a little bit and got our oxygen going. But geez, I mean, that was really stupid. They forgot. They just, you know, put their masks on, the cockpit, the pilots put their masks on and, and went up and, and didn't bother to tell the rest of us they were doing it. <laughs> and I couldn't figure out why I was getting so damn cold. Well, because of the altitude, it gets cold. And uh, well, that funny to get straightened out, but that was a that was not a good experience. <laughs> Matter of fact, that was a time when I got really pissed off with my officers. Did you like the B-17? Did I like it? You bet. <laughs> Brought me home every time. <laughs> I'm very much in favor of it. All right. Makes good sense. Um. <laughs> Come on. What, are the, Some of your missions? what are the kinds of missions did you do? What kind well, of places did you we go? Flew, we flew a lot of missions into France. Boy, it goes right out of my head. What was it? The target. Well, we had coastal stuff, I recall that, where we bombed harbors mm -hmm. and shipping. We had, oh yeah, well, uh, yeah, on, on D-Day we were over the coast of France. They keep talking about going to uh, Omaha Beach on June 6th. I was at Omaha Beach on June 5th. <laughs> uh, what, what were you doing there? What, were you, what was your assignment? Uh, bombing gun emplacements. German. Uh -huh. The Germans had gun emplacements. They were dual purpose, anti-aircraft and <laughs> regular artillery. Mm -hmm. Those 88 millimeter cannons were probably the best artillery piece in World War II. We didn't have anything that was as good as they were. And we did spent a lot of our missions in France were to hit emplacements of German 88 millimeter cannons. And that's what we were doing in Omaha Beach that day, the day before bombing those gun emplacements. Um, uh, when was the first time you were under fire? The first time, the first day I flew, May 12, 1944. Mm -hmm. uh, what was that like? Well, scary. Whose target was the uh, Luna oil refinery in Merseburg, Germany, which is right in central Germany. You had to go a long ways into Germany to get there. And 
they really didn't want us messing with their oil. And they had a lot of flat guns there. And I can recall as we swung onto that target, the sky was just black with these black puffs. And, uh, well, you've got no choice. You have to fly into it. Nobody has ever, in the whole of World War II in Europe, nobody ever was turned back. No matter how bad the, the flak or the fighters got, they kept on going. Uh, did you receive any injuries? Did I? Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. No, we were fortunate. Our crew got through. But and, uh, did I forget something? Here, piece of metal. Did you get, did you get in your nose? What did you get? The oh, yeah. yeah. I got hit in the nose with a little teeny piece of shrapnel. I don't know. I've, I've had it for years and I don't know where it is. I finally lost it. <laughs> Uh, so your plane took damage on occasion? Oh, yeah. Yeah? What of? Any close calls? Well, that was one. You know what that was? I think it was a rivet. I know I got hit in the arm once with a rivet where a piece of flak apparently grazed the side of the airplane and sheared the rivets and drove one all the way across the radio room and it hit me in the arm. Wow. But, uh, you know, it wasn't anything that, that hurt or anything, but I remember being, I could feel the thing hit me. Um, what were some of the more interesting things or inspiring events that happened while you were in service? Well, a very inspiring event was the day I got my discharge. <laughs> uh, um, what kind of uh, code, what, what did you do as a radio man? What? Oh, well, my function was to maintain communication with the base in England and headquarters in England. Our pilot radios were short range. They could talk to other planes in the group. They could talk to the commanding officer flying the group. Mm -hmm. They could talk to the fighter escort planes. But they couldn't talk to the base back in England or to headquarters in England. Those radios that you talked on were short-ranged, and the pilots didn't have all the training that we had in communication. So they gave us the high-powered sets, and we talked using Morse code. Mm -hmm. And we could communicate with the base back in England or with the headquarters back in England with our long-range, well, CW, carrier wave sets, which was done using the key and sending Morse code. And that was the main reason they had us there. And also, technically, we were supposed to be radio mechanics so that we could fix any radios in flight but that was sort of a wishful thinking type situation because if a radio got hit with a machine gun bullet or a 20 millimeter shell, you're not going to stand there at 30 or 40 below zero and take your gloves off and fix a ball <laughs> of wrecked metal. <laughs> Makes sense. Um, where was uh, your gun in relation to the radio? How could you get back and forth between those? Well, <coughs> the radio room was right aft of the bomb bay. And it was a small room, long from here to the length of that table. There was a door at each end. And up overhead was a hatch. 
and there was a gun in that hatch. In the forward end, if this is the front of the plane, right in this part of that room was the desk where the radio equipment was. And you sat there facing this way, right up over your head was the handles for the, the handheld gun. Mm -hmm. But it was not a really useful gun because it was in a location that you had virtually no place that anybody would attack you from that position. And if you weren't careful, you'd shoot your own tail. And uh, so basically, it was a useless gun. And eventually, they took them right out. They never even bothered with them. And uh, what we did was, I could set my equipment so that I could pick up any messages that I needed to from the waist position. I'd get all my radios set, and then I'd go back there, take over a waist gun, and bring a pencil and a pad with me. And any messages that came in, I could get them through the intercom. I could hear the code in the background. Mm -hmm. You had to learn to read the code backwards, because the code would be da 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 but if you read it in the background with people talking, what you hear is when it hits, the talking stops. So you hear, you read blanks instead of buzzes. It's weird, it's hard to explain. But if people are talking on the intercom and they send code over, when the code uh -huh. button comes down and goes bop, you don't hear the talking, you hear silence. So you hear background noise interspersed with dots and dashes of silence, but you have to read them backwards in order to get it. Oh, wow. <laughs> so you learn how to do it. Uh, apparently. And uh, you would use that intercom to tell the pilot or whoever needed to know what manner of messages were right. coming through? That's right, yep, yep. All right. Like uh, one particular time I remember getting a message that said, the reports of many enemy aircraft over the target, and we were being alerted to watch for it. You know, so I immediately mm -hmm. called the pilot and said that's what the message was. Mm -hmm. um, did you ever need to fire your gun? Or? Did I? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes, every time somebody pointed one of those yellow noses at me, I fired it at it. <laughs> uh, so, not quite as useless as you hinted? <laughs> oh, the, uh, the the waste gun? No. I never did get to use the one on the radio. Uh, Alright. So, um... No, I've had plenty of opportunities to use the one on the waste. Alright. Do, uh, did the bombers count the number of planes they shot down like the fighters did? Or did they, uh... Well, the guys of used to, but we really didn't bother too much. No. I, I don't know, I think the fighters, they were a different breed of cat, those pilots. They were, they were basically a bunch of hot shots. And, yeah. uh, and they wanted the world to know that they were. And most of us were guys who had already washed out of the hot shot department. <laughs> and ended up as gunners. Right. So, um, you, you were involved. What was the normal resistance you would encounter on a mission? Well, you always got flak. That's an anti-aircraft fire. Mm -hmm. you not, you didn't always get fighter attacks, but you always counted on it. And uh, in the event of a fighter attack, you would? Just for it was every ounce of your strength. Because if you didn't fight them all, they'd shoot you down. Uh, um, um, where did you go from your base in the British Isles? Did you go anywhere after that? Go oh, home. Oh. Right. They uh, they didn't get to Paris. I don't think the 
American troops didn't get to Paris till three weeks after I was finished and home. So there was there were no really air bases on the continent, continent at that time. And uh, as a kind of an afterthought, what what unit were you assigned to at this time? Well, it was the Eighth Air Force, three eighty fourth bomb group. 547th Bomb Squadron. See, the 384th Bomb Group had four squadrons, 4, 544, 45, 46, 47. Uh -huh. What? What? The, the Air Force is still part of the Army? Oh, yeah, the Army. Oh, yes, that's right. Yes, it was Army Air Force. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's what we call the Brown Suit Air Force. Uh, what did you think when later the Air Force became its own entity? I didn't think too much. I didn't care much one way or another. I was long out. <laughs> I was back in school then. Uh, I remember thinking, well, okay, <laughs> that's what you want. It's okay by me. But I was unimpressed one way or another. Fair enough. Um, what was what was your last mission like after what? what what were you thinking? What were your thoughts when you were done? Well, it was a pretty exciting time. I went with a, my pilot had finished. My co-pilot had finished. And I had gotten a blistered heel by being stupid and wearing a new pair of shoes and we went on furlough to Edinburgh, Scotland for a week. And I took that one pair of shoes. So by the time we got back to the base, my blister got infected. So I lost three or four missions. Well, the rest of the guys went on. I'm in the hospital with an infected foot. So I ended up flying my last mission. I can't remember his name. I think it was Dudok, but I don't recall. I only flew one, that one mission. And, uh, I flew as a waste gunner and just to get it over with. But I recall flying my next to last mission, I went to the sergeant who assigned you to flying and said that I would just as soon I'd appreciate it if you'd put me on for tomorrow so I can get it done with. And he did, and I went with this fellow named Dudak, I think his name was. And that's all I recall, except that I was very glad when it was done. And he let me come up in the cockpit when we came in over the field, and he buzzed the field, and I fired green and yellow flares out through the, the hole in the roof of the airplane, which guys did when they finished their tour a bunch of flares firing them up out of the aircraft to celebrate. <laughs> oh, well, no, I didn't get discharged for a year after I got home. How does that work? <laughs> you stay in until they tell you you can go. <laughs> so what were you doing from the time you went home well, to the time you were discharged? farting around, really, it was ridiculous. <laughs> We had to, uh, what the heck did they, they sent me to, I got married, that was one thing. And went to, then was sent to Miami Beach. Was supposed to go to Atlantic City, New Jersey for what they call rehabilitation, which was a kind of a vacation on the beach okay. and they had a hurricane and Miami, Atlantic City got kaput. <laughs> so they shipped us to Miami and they said, don't bring your wife. I'm just married. I'm not going to bring her. Bull. <laughs> so I brought her <laughs> and we get down there and uh, it was a pretty good deal. They said they got, don't bring her because there's no place for them. Well, they had a place. <laughs> 
we got a nice room in a hotel right on the beach. I remember going out on the beach and throwing a ball with her. God, she could throw a ball. And she kept waving me back till I got to where I couldn't throw the damn ball back to her. <laughs> she still even down. <laughs> God, I remember that. <laughs> and we spent several days there. I got a real bad sunburn, I remember that. Then we went to some place in the mid Midwest to, of all places, I had to go back to radio school. What? I can't read it. Doctor on polio. You didn't have to go. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, where did I go? They sent us to ridiculous places, you know. Mm. After being the whole tour of operations, they couldn't make me fly in combat again. I'd already done that. So what do they do? They send me to gunnery school again. <laughs> and then they sent us to Yuma, Arizona, to another gunnery school for radio operators. It almost didn't make sense, but that's what they did do. They didn't know what the hell else to do. <laughs> Actually, it was a jobs program for a lot of non-flying Air Corps officers. Mm -hmm. The only Air Corps officers that really had to work were the ones that flew. The rest of them they had to keep finding jobs for, and these were the kind of jobs they found for them, running us around. <laughs> and put in a lot of time doing that. Useless, waste of time. Then when I went for my discharge, the doctor was giving me an examination and he says, you had polio, didn't you? Because he could tell by looking at my legs. Mm -hmm. And I said, yes. He says, what the hell are you doing in the army? You didn't even have to be in. So I said, you wouldn't believe how hard I worked to get in. <laughs> and you're telling me I didn't have to? I said, I'm not ashamed of what I did, are you? What um what people do you remember that from your time in service? Oh yeah, I remember. There's three of us on the crew are still alive. Except I don't I'm not sure about Steve the pilot. He is in real bad shape with Parkinson's disease. He was a farm boy from Nebraska. Not very tall just a little bit shorter than I am, but stocky and had a pair of hands that were like ham, boy, and big powerful arms. Boy, could he fly that airplane. And the last I knew of him, he was in really bad shape, can't even talk now. Mm -hmm. And he and I, and the only other one that I know of is Lou Mayo, who was our top turret gunner from New Bern, South Carolina. He's, last I heard, was still in good health. And all the rest of the guys are dead. And uh, this talks about your, your, the experiences that left the greatest impression on you. And you, you mentioned seeing the uh, clouds of flak. And uh, the other one is being in the middle of a dogfight. Did you tell us about that? Well, it's really, it's like being in, in a big beehive. It just seemed like everywhere you looked there were airplanes going in every direction. And you, you wonder how there could be so many of them doing so much in such a small space and not of them all smashing together. You know, just 
wild with uh, you know fighter planes, American fighter planes and British fighter planes and German fighter planes and American bombers all mixed up together. And the bombers still in some sort of <coughs> what a formation. Because our primary job was not to fight fighters, was to bomb targets. And so we were, we had to stay in formation and keep plowing ahead no matter what. And the fighters were left to do all the crazy stuff. But I, it was just wild. I have to laugh now because they talk about near miss, aviation near collision. They came within a half a mile of each other. What if they came within that far of each other? Wow. That I've seen hundreds of those. They came within a half a mile. For Christ's sake, you land that close together. What did you do after you were discharged? Took a nap. <laughs> Let's see. Well, I, I went back to school. I got out, I've forgotten when, but it was in, in November. They were still on what they call the trimester, three semesters at Wesleyan. Mm -hmm. So, the man who was the president of Wesleyan had been a professor who was also a fraternity brother of mine and a very good friend. So I called him and he said that the, there, there was a, you know, semester starting in November and recommended that I come right back and get going. So that's what we did, went back to Wesleyan and, and started a, my junior year. And uh, what did you what did you major in this time? Economics. No, all right. And, uh, and I graduated in June of 1947 with distinction in economics, which in that and fifty cents is worth a cup of coffee. <laughs> What, uh, what kind of things have you done since then? Not much, just rested on my laurels. <laughs> job? Was your job? Yeah. What? I had a job. What? What? Selling. I was an ad retail advertising salesman for the Observer Dispatch. Oh for 32 years. Excellent. Right. Um, any closing comments, lessons to impart, such now? Well, it's hard to think about any lessons to impart. <laughs> Avoid wars if possible. Uh, sounds good. And avoid work if possible. <laughs> Excellent. I'm well on my way. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. I brought these out. You wanted to? Yep. Well, uh,